I'm about as real as they come. All my beats tailored by Drew. Maserati Rick in Detroit Convertible bird in Miami Graduated summa cum laude Strip club made a tsunami Carlton Hines with the ball game Rayful Edmonds with the snowflakes Craig Pettis in the M-Town Sal Magluta with the boat game Falcone with the cocaine Like Freeway Ricky with the plug game Like Monster Cody in South Central Larry Davis from Close Range From the crime subcommittee The death penalty for major traffickers streets up. He's only 17 years old, 18 years old, we kids. From the crime subcommittee, the death penalty for major traffickers. Going some phase two. Could we form Elizabeth Port projects? It's called E-Port because of the port area. But phase two, we named it when you go to the next level. There's another level in life. So this thing go next level, we just called it phase two. That means the next level. And we tore the streets up. We beat these streets up so hard, man. So heavy, let me, the feds came. And we never knew about the feds. From the crime subcommittee, the death penalty for major traffickers. Get up in there, my man sees me. He said, yo, I'm gonna get an Oscar for this one, Sean. So what you mean, you gonna give me an Oscar for this one? It's six months into the bed, they give my man the death penalty. First person get a death penalty in New Jersey. He said, I told you don't give me an Oscar. I worked for the House Crime Subcommittee in the spring of 1986, and in June, Len Bias dies. Suddenly, voltage goes through the Congress. The lights go on. Drugs. Drugs. You're over, you know, every, every little theater of operations that can have a hearing. Energy and commerce. Uh, Merchant Marine and Fisheries, Interior and Insular Affairs, Armed Services, Ways and Means. I mean, everybody is like drugs. You know, the, 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 the curtain goes up and hearings are held on what every congressional committee can do about drugs. Even though the war on drugs had been initiated more than a decade earlier by President Nixon in October of 1970, I wholeheartedly believe that 1986 was the most pivotal year and that so-called war. Now, the significance is not solely due to the tragic events such as the death of Lynn Bias on June 19th, or even the murder of Officer Burns in Queens, New York on October the 22nd of that year. But it would be a new drug and a controversial new drug bill drafted by current President Biden and signed by then President Ronald Reagan that would have severe ramifications for anybody involved in the drug game but none more than a teenage drug kingpin from Elizabeth, New Jersey, by the name of Bilal Pretlow. Among the sweeping changes proposed was a new law mandating minimum sentences for federal drug convictions, eliminating a judge's discretion in pronouncing sentence. Members in our subcommittee, the crime subcommittee, said, look, we want mandatory minimums. We want higher level penalties. And at the, sort of at the end of like, so really this, three or four week little period, suddenly this was on literally on the table without a hearing, without any really preparation. There was not a lot of study. Uh, there was a call for action uh, in Congress. There was talk about, uh, you know, the, the way the normal legislative process runs. They do full scale hearings and they bring experts in and they do a, an awful lot of uh, investigation. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, with crack cocaine in particular. We didn't have any testimony from DEA. We didn't have any testimony from any police. The way it happened was, Eric, go make some phone calls, find out. It was, it was left to me. Now, I was not a narc, I was not a prosecutor. And so I talked to somebody at DEA and they gave me some ideas. DEA defined high-level traffickers in terms of hundreds of thousands of doses. And members of Congress, they looked at those numbers kind of gagged. Said, you know, that, that's too much. You know, we need much lower numbers. For example, I remember Congressman Mazzoli from Louisville, Kentucky, saying, you know, we don't have that kind of traffic in Louisville. I can't vote for this bill if it's not going to have some real effect in Louisville. We need much smaller quantities. And that's how the numbers got developed on a very on 
on sort of the bl you know the blind leading the blind. I was one of those who was blind. Members of Congress were jockeying for position in front of the TV camera about what they were doing about the drug crisis. We're going to cut back any. I assume, if anything, there'll be more money next year. This bill is important. It's essential. We have broken new ground, and for the first time, we have a national strategy. For a person who sells drugs to children, there should be no mercy on them. I'm glad that the uh, uh, forest strangers will be armed, and uh, that was important to me. And then eventually CBS News did a national TV story on crack. 48 Hours on Crack Street is a long story, two hours, with Dan Rather, the national anchor. And it did two things. It awakened the rest of the United States as to the dangers of this drug. But more importantly, it awakened the politicians in Washington. The drug war became a national obsession. There's an epidemic of the cocaine called crack. It is epidemic and it can kill. The crack problem has become a crack crisis and it's spreading nationwide. This is Clements Avenue in Charleston, South Carolina. Here in Bakersfield, city parks like this one have become favorite hangouts for drug dealers. It's around Philadelphia's 8th and Butler Harbor of flourishing drug trade. Manchester, New Hampshire. A huge increase in stories about drugs and the drug warriors began to change people's attitudes. With the midterm elections approaching and public opinion polls listing drugs as the number one concern of voters, the politicians in Washington were working overtime. Every week, new pieces of anti-drug legislation were being reported out of one committee or another. Press conferences were being held, hearings were being held. In record time, Congress rewrote virtually all the nation's drug laws, a get-tough crackdown unparalleled in drug war history. Measures included from the Armed Services Committee, for the first time, direct involvement of the U.S. military in interdiction. From the Committee on Merchant Marine and Fisheries, stiff penalties for drugs found on any American boat. From the Judiciary Committee, federal penalties for money laundering and a new asset forfeiture law that allowed federal police agencies to keep the property they seized. From the Agriculture Committee, the arming of forest rangers. From the Crime Subcommittee, the death penalty for major traffickers. Life in prison for some repeat offenders. More severe federal penalties for simple possession. The mammoth omnibus drug bill passed both houses of Congress with an overwhelming majority. Federal sentences for marijuana, heroin, and cocaine were unprecedented in their severity. Federal parole in most drug cases was eliminated. What began as alarm over the crack epidemic had mushroomed into a program requiring the incarceration of tens of thousands. The reaction on the Hill was mandatory minimums. So then the issue becomes, uh, well, now we need more prisons. Prison building became the biggest public works business in America, with both federal and state legislatures approving a huge increase in funds for construction projects. And across the country, hundreds of new prisons were built. Over the next decade, the budget for prisons increased by more than 160 percent. The prison population more than doubled from 540,000 to 1,200,000. The number of prison guards also doubled. But this was only the beginning of what became a bonanza for drug enforcement enterprises. I ran into one of my best friends. His name was Bilal Prado at that time. And I got with Bilal. And, you know, he was like a friend, a father, uh, a cousin. You know, everything that, you know what I'm saying, you, you, you dudes look for in the streets, I found in him. He, he you know, he, you know he's, he, he's there from every day. Real friend. He's telling me about the streets. I'm ready to come home. I'm ready to leave, escape. Fuck this juvenile joint. Get back to the street. Get some money with him. We making hundreds of thousands. He's out there beating the streets up. He's only 17 years old, 18 years old. We kids. 
most money we ever had in our life. We were poor. Mothers on drugs, nothing. And we street millionaires don't even know it. We don't even have no, we don't even know nothing about credit. We don't know nothing about nothing. All we know is we got money. Money. We ain't got we ain't got we ain't gotta be poor never again. So I come home from jail for my juvenile beer. I'm happy. Back to the streets, my man on your team is on. They rolling. Everybody rolling. We turns it up to full blast. Feel me? Call ourselves phase two. Cause we from Elizabeth Port Projects, which is called Eport, because of the port area. But phase two, we named it when you go to the next level. There's another level in life. So this ain't going next level, we just called it phase two. That means the next level. And we tore the streets up. We beat these streets up so hard, man. So heavy. Feel me? The feds came. That we never knew about the feds. We never heard these people. 18 years old. I was 17. So they got my man Blarry locked up on other charges. So now feds come in, swipe the whole projects. The feds done to sweep me. Let me. I get up in there, my man sees me. He said, Yo, I'm gonna get an Oscar for this one, Sean. So what you mean? You're gonna give me an Oscar for this one. It's six months into the bed, they give my man a death penalty. First person get a death penalty in New Jersey. He said, I told you don't give me an Oscar. Now, when I say out of all of the stories that I've told, and I've told a lot, not too many hit my heart like this one. Hey, what up, though? Shay's popular. Salute the almighty mob. We headed to New Jersey with this shit. Y'all meet us in Elizabeth. We about to discuss the stuff of legend, rumored to be a millionaire by his teenage years. Today, I'm going to do my best to tell you the story about, I want to say a guy because he was a man because of the way he was moving. But when you look at his age, you can really say a kid that the government would set their sights on to become a prototype for a new anti-crime bill to combat a new drug that was spreading through the country at an epidemic type level. Now, this person that I'm speaking of, whose name and family's namesake will always go down in royalty in the state of New Jersey is none other than Bilal Pretlow. If you can think back to a time in the late 80s, specifically between 1986 and 1988, there's not too many people that you're going to be able to name that will have a bigger presence in their city, Elizabeth, or their state for that matter, than Bilal. An enterprise that the government would explain starting with him selling marijuana in his junior year at Elizabeth High School in a few years would turn into a multi-million dollar operation with Bilal claiming the Pioneer Homes in Elizabeth as his headquarters. In describing the organization, a detective by the name of Thomas G. Swan would testify before the State of New Jersey Commission of Investigations during a public hearing discussing African-American crime, he would discuss a particularly vicious group of young African-American males that operated a cocaine trafficking network in Elizabeth as well as the Clinton Avenue area of Newark. He would testify further that organization members would call themselves the Eport Posse or either Phase 2 after the Elizabeth Seaport and modeled the gang after the Jamaican posses that was running around terrorizing the United States right around that time. With a steady supplier in nearby New York by the name of Benson, as teenagers, the group would control a majority of the cocaine trade in the city of Elizabeth, with most of the group's members not even old enough to get a driver's license. They would be sending kilos in and around the town using taxi cabs. At its height, the group would make hundreds of thousands of dollars every week, possibly blinded by the riches, or just how fast things seem to move when money start coming in and what will be the best time because arguably in history, there's no other time that would birth more street millionaires or make poor niggas hood rich was actually also the worst time with then President Ronald Reagan and his wife Nancy leading the country in a so-called war on drugs and the super drug crack on the horizon. Right around the same time, an anti-crime bill was being passed, with lawmakers looking to get tough on drug dealers that Bilal Pretlow and his Phase 2 crew was on a crash course for. Now, I said this story hits me hard 
because we often talk about the riches, but we don't talk about the losses nearly enough. Between the two years, between 1986 to 1988, even though Bilal would rise further in his life financially than he had ever before, the losses that he would endure are almost unimaginable. As within the next two years, from 1989 to 1991, just as fast as he would rise the two years prior, things would tragically fall. Bilal Pretlow's brother, who he allegedly got in the game with, Robert Preflow, was allegedly murdered by a rival drug dealer on July 9, 1989. Not long after the murder of Robert, another brother of Bilal, Thomas Pretlow, would be charged in the murder of a Newark drug dealer by the name of Bobby Ray Davis. Documents would state that Davis would end up being killed because he possibly had aspirations on muscling in on the Pretlow drug turf, with the police also believing that it was the retaliation for the murder of Robert Preflow. Making matters worse, just a month prior, in June 1989, a man by the name of Muta Sesums, who was said to be an associate slash member of the group, who authorities also describe as a confidential informant, would end up being murdered. Now you add that with the murder of a teenage girl and another rival drug dealer. And when you add that in the United States government's eyes, that would equal the death penalty. Bilal Pretlow, along with eight other co-defendants, would end up being indicted on a RICO charge. But the worst would be yet to come, as not long later, on January 18, 1991, the United States would file a superseding indictment, where besides being charged with the murders on the first indictment, he would also be charged with intentionally causing the death of Melanie Baker, as well as Mouton Sesums, while working in the conspiracy of a continuing criminal enterprise, or CCE. And it would be with that superseding indictment that the government would be entitled to seek the death penalty against Bilal Pretlow. And it would be on that very same exact day in 1991 that the government will file notice of intention to actually seek the death penalty against the 21-year-old. His case would be one of only three, with the other two occurring in Chicago and Alabama, where the federal government would look to seek the death penalty under these new laws that they had drafted. Testimony for his trial will begin towards the end of that year, on December 9th, 1991, with the trial expected to last several months. But less than a month into his death penalty RICO case, the 21-year-old Bilal Pretlow would be found hanging by a bed sheet in a shower at the Union County Jail in Elizabeth, New Jersey. His death would be quickly ruled a suicide, but his family seemed like they didn't really believe that theory with his grandmother, Eleanor Graham, saying she personally spoke with Bilal on Christmas night and even after, and that he seemed to be in good spirits. She would also explain that there was a camera looking into his specific cell, saying that if he was under 24-hour surveillance, why didn't anyone notice his bed sheet was missing? So adding more mystery on one of the most mysterious kingpins to come out of our era. This is definitely one of those stories that I think everybody should hear and even one that made me want to start the channel. Now y'all make sure y'all hit the red bell and subscribe button right under this video so y'all know when this real trill spill shit is dropping. Y'all get in the comment box below, y'all run it up. Let me know what cities we need to go to, what stories we need to tell, what we missed, what we got wrong, all of that. Y'all tap in directly, Instagram, Twitter, P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. And until the re-up, y'all know the rundown. Shades popular. Salute the almighty mob.